Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, we're going to get to the 11th and 12th verses briefly this morning. What I want you to look at with me is what exactly is the spiritual condition of the world when Jesus says that we're approaching the end of days. There are two descriptions that I want you to notice that characterize the earth, the people around you, the earth dwellers, as they're called in Revelation, the world those apart from Christ, are characterized by two spiritual qualities. And as Jesus' earthly ministry was coming to a close, he pulled his disciples aside. He took them on the side of the Mount of Olives, looking across at the city of Jerusalem, and he said, this is what the world will look like in the end of days. Verse 11 and verse 12 of Matthew 24. Jesus said this, Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. So the first spiritual quality of the end of days is increasing spiritual deception. But look at verse 12 for the second one. And because lawlessness will abound, in other words, because sin will be flying around the globe at warp speed, doesn't that sound like the society we live in? In the time of Moses, it took weeks or months for news to get out. Wars would be won and people wouldn't know it for three to six months. They'd be still fighting. Nowadays, if, if Drudge does not refresh at every blink and have something new that has changed, we're, we feel it's slow. We see news and especially evil traveling so fast. And look how it says, it says lawlessness will overflow. It will just, at, at great speeds, be traveling everywhere. But look at the effect, the spiritual effect. Because lawlessness will abound, Jesus said, the love of many will grow cold. Now think about this. Jesus warned, as the end of days approaches, false doctrine would increase. So think about that. False teaching, false doctrine error would increase and that real, genuine, godly, spirit-prompted love would decrease. So think of, the, uh, of charting that, of graphing that, okay? That false doctrine will increase. That genuine, real, complete, healthy, sound, biblical love, it will be on the decline. The word grow cold, if you look at the very last two words of verse 12, grow cold is not an adjective describing a condition. It's a primary verb describing the active display of love, that it will be radically decreased. You understand, it's not the feeling of love. It's not the appearance of love. It is the activity, because love in the New Testament is defined not as a description, but as an action. And it says here, the action of love will be radically decreased. So, I'm going to give you a little test now. This is a little quiz, okay? Everybody ready? Here we go. False doctrine will increase. And real love will what? Decrease. Now, because God knew that that was the direction things were going, he had a plan for Christ's church that would be living in the time when false doctrine is ascending and real love is descending in the sense of decreasing. Now, what is that plan? Let's go back to Titus 2. Titus 2. Not only do all roads lead to Rome, but all sermons lead to Titus 2. Right? There we go. And it's exactly the plan of God to counter the increasing false doctrine and the decreasing genuine love. Now I want you to notice this because as the church nears the end of the age faced with increasing false doctrine and decreasing genuine love, Christ church is prepared. Titus 2.2, if you look closely at the fourth and fifth qualities God wants to be lived out, notice what they are right in the center of this verse. This is what it says in Titus 2.2. The older men... Quality one, be sober. Quality two, be reverent. Quality three, be temperate. And then, as we've seen for the last many weeks, that they are to be sound in faith. That means that they have healthy, complete doctrine. The word sound uh, comes from the word being whole, complete, healthy, all there, fully functioning. It's used of a human body. That is, that is fully functional and, and all systems are operating, that you're in good health. 
So it says you have healthy or sound faith. But look at the next one. And sound in love. The sound in modifies the three in order. It says sound in faith, sound in love, sound in patience. But notice in verse 2 the proximity of sound in faith versus the false doctrine that's coming. You see, God's plan to counter false doctrine is people who have a healthy, sound, complete faith. And God's plan for countering the defective love is soundness in love. And so Paul was addressing a current need, but also a future need that we who live as the end of days approaches, that we would be prepared God wants his love lived out in Christ's church throughout all history. God wants every member of Christ's family to see soundness of love in action. Not to hear it talked about, not to sing about it merely, not to hope I get those feelings someday, but to see love in action, lived out. And so, starting with the older godly men, that's where we are in verse 2. If you look there, it says the older men. And we already saw when we looked at the, even the records from the day that these are men that are in their 50s and onward. That's specifically the time period that Paul was talking about. We looked at Hippocrates, the father of medicine. He said that there were three classes of men and that the, the middle class, the, the ones that were at their prime, started at age 50. And that's exactly the, the medical descriptive word that Paul uses. So men who, who have come to the zenith and the apex of their career and their knowledge and ability, those men are also to be at the height of their spiritual influence, and he wants them to model and be examples to the flock. So the Lord wants sound and healthy love experienced by each member, lived out each day before a watching and often loveless world. You see, we're supposed to have genuine, sound love, healthy biblical, spirit-prompted love, lived out before an often loveless world. Their love is growing cold, and dangerously so, the love of Christ's church at the end is also growing cold, if you remember from Revelation. So as we come to this fifth quality of a godly man, a grace-energized man. Let me ask all of us who are gathered here today, how sound, if I did a little exam, if God gave us a little, uh, you know, one of those little pricks where you can do a little quick blood test, you know, check your sugar level, or, or one of those little, uh, you know, things you can sit in at the uh, grocery store or at Walgreens and check your blood pressure, uh, or, you know, one of those kind of little quick spiritual, uh, those are physical, but if we could do a quick spiritual test on the soundness of our love, How sound, how healthy, how complete, how fully functional is your love? Not the emotion, the action, as the Bible describes it. That's the question we have to ask ourselves this morning. Do we have healthy love? Do we have the kind of love that God says characterizes everyone that he moves inside of? Now, look, look at Titus 2.2 for another thing, which I thought was fascinating. I call this the sacred trio, okay? In the scriptures, there's a sacred trio that sang often in the early church. Paul named this trio faith, hope, and love. Do you remember from the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13? Now there abideth faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is what? Love. See the trio, but the lead singer was love. Well, Paul constantly reminded the early saints that when the grace of God flows through our lives, the byproduct will be faith, hope, and love. And the trio may be explained as when God's grace energizes us, there are three clear character qualities that show up in our life. Look at chapter 2, verse 2. I I just want to show you there right here. First, sound in faith. That's what we've looked at for several weeks. There's the faith part of the trio. That means we guard a healthy mind in a sick world, especially we guard a healthy mind believing truth about God in an increasingly false, permeated doctrine world. Our world is permeated with false teaching and false doctrine. It just spins around the planet faster than than we can keep up with it. So we have to make sure the church is guarding a healthy mind. But right in the middle it says sound in love. 
And what I'm talking about this morning is how we need to stay tender-hearted. We need to stay compassionate. We need to stay genuine in our actions of love in the midst of a cruel and loveless world. I mean, we all know the story of the Good Samaritan. But you know, that story goes on today. Did you know across the roads and highways of Tulsa that literally thousands, probably tens or hundreds of thousands of people are going to church today? There are 1,100 churches in Tulsa. And a great number of the people in this town are genuine born-again believers. And do you know how many of them were so trying to get to church on time for their Sunday school class or they had the donuts for the choir or they were supposed to practice? Do you know how many people are probably sitting by the roadside, broken down, flat tire, all over the city? And you know what we do when we drive by them? We say, hope you have AAA. I'm going to church. Isn't that how it is? I mean, the Good Samaritan story hasn't changed. We all struggle to show the action of genuine love. Well, this final piece is, is in verse 2, and that is the sound in patience, and that's finishing hopefully in a despairing world, that hope there, that patient waiting hope we're going to come to. But as we know, love is defined by God as an action. The best place, and I want you to turn now, because this is where we're going to stay, and you don't have to leave it. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. And as I was reading and thinking and pondering and studying for the last two weeks, I thought, you know, I don't think I've ever really preached through 1 Corinthians 13. I've alluded to it. In fact, I use it all the time at weddings. But I have never, to the assembled, gathered church, ever gone through the actions that characterize Christ-prompted love. So this morning, as we know from 1 Corinthians 13, any doctrine not wrapped in love is useless to God in his plan for Christ's church. Remember he says, though I do it all, and do it all correctly and precisely doctrinally, if it's not wrapped in love, then it amounts to nothing. And all ministry, no matter how huge and sacrificial that we offer, no matter how hard we work and labor to exhaustion, if what prompts us is not the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, then that huge sacrificial offering of ministry work amounts to nothing. You see, the, this chapter talks about the primacy of God as love shining out through our lives. So 1 Corinthians 13 is God's plan for Christ's church. And to best see love as it should be, the sound and healthy love that the Lord desires to flow out of our lives, we need to study not just to academically know, but to do a spiritual soundness of love, healthy love, whether my love is complete. And what we're going to see, we're going to read verses 4 through 8 in just a moment, but as we read them, you're going to find that there are two qualities that are positive, then following that, eight qualities that are negative, and then five more positive. There are seven positive expressions of love and eight things that love doesn't do. But all 15 of these characteristics are a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. This is almost a photograph of Christ. And we're supposed to hold it up in the mirror of the word and look at our life and say, in what ways am I not like Jesus Christ? Because Christ in me, if allowed to live out through me, lives life this way. So in other words, any way we're not loving, we're hindering Christ living that out through us. And we should repent of that this morning and ask him to let his love be shed abroad through our lives. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Verse 5, Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Verse 6, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. I pray, O Lord, that we would be sound in love this morning. I pray that your spirit would, would stir our hearts and convict us of each area that we are unchristlike in.
Because the only reason we're not Christ-like in that area is that we are hindering you. We are resisting what you want to live through us. Our self-disposition, we're disposed toward our own desires instead of yours, and we resist you. And I pray that your spirit within us, your word convicting us, and your grace energizing us will cause all of us to turn away from the unchristlike responses in our life and to clothe ourselves with your love this morning, especially as we prepare to come before you and commune with you at your table. So open our eyes, open our hearts, move us toward Christ-like love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I just want to show you the, the wonderful list. Uh, if I had time, I would show you the, the sins of Corinth because the, the whole book of 1 Corinthians exactly is a, an antithesis to this list of love. Every one of these qualities they were not doing in one part of the church or another. And the sins of Corinth are rampant. But we don't have time for those this morning. But in 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 8, it's the picture of genuine love. But it isn't Paul's thoughts. He didn't assess the, the mighty vocabulary of the Greek language to write this beautiful poem of love. Rather, it's the work of a divine photographer. God is the photographer. He sets Christ up as the subject, and he takes a picture of him and has Paul record that picture in verses 4 through 8. It's a picture, a divine portrait of Jesus Christ. It's Christ Jesus' actions in view here. And it's what he wants to act out through us. Jesus was and is incarnate love. And to love like God desires us to love is to be like Christ. And the degree of our failure to live this way is the degree of our failure to embrace what Christ wants to live through us. We resist him. And so in every way that we aren't this way, I hope this morning that you and I, all of us, will say, Lord, I repent of that unchristlike action in my life. It is not the way Jesus Christ lives. And I don't want to resist you anymore in that area, and God will do it. In his presence, the presence of Christ is fullness of joy. And only as we spend time in his presence and in meditating on his word, like this passage, can he bring this to pass. And by the way, there's no instant way to become a mature, biblical, love-filled believer. You know, we're so used to instant everything. There's instant food and there's instant communications. I mean, we just are uh, constantly in touch with each other. There's instant updates and, um, you know, we can always be instantly in our computer age getting everything. This is not instant. The, The best way for us is to faithfully seek incrementally to identify areas in this list of these 15 and say, Lord, I see clearly today that I do not have this kindness. I do not have this aspect. I don't have this this humility or whatever aspect of the 15 resonates in your heart. And just say, Lord, I'd like you to change that today. Instead of saying, instantly, just make me loving. It's learned actions allowing Christ through his spirit to live through us. But let's look at the list. To start our own personal pursuit of complete and healthy biblical love, let's review the picture. And you can look at these. You can circle the words if they're not marked in your Bible or jot a note or something. But there are 15 different actions that characterize Christ's love that should characterize our lives. And all of us fail in some part of this list, but all of us should be seeking to be more and more Christ-like each day. Number one, Christ in me, verse four, will be, first word, patient. This word is always used of patience, not with circumstances, but with people. A lot of people can be patient with circumstances. I mean, you know, the car broke down, the computer, but it's people that bother us. And this specifically is patience with people. It's seen when we have especially the power to avenge and we don't do it. This word that's used for patience literally means long-tempered, the grace-energized ability to be wronged over and over again. Now, just saying that grates against us because we, one of the sins of the Corinthians was that, that they loved to go to court and get their rights. And they were constantly suing to get what they wanted. And they fought to get their rights, which were their rights. But in Christ, 
we lay down our rights and find the rights of others to be more important than our own. Doesn't that sound... That sounds terrible, doesn't it, to us? I mean, we've been taught to, you know, take advantage of your rights and do everything you can to preserve and protect, but in Christ, we are supposed to be patient with people. In fact, Paul, in 2 Corinthians 6, 6, describes himself patiently this way. In fact, every Christian, Ephesians 4, 2, is to act this way, and the manifestation of the Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, is this word. So if we are not bearing long with people who trample on us, then we are resisting the Holy Spirit in this area. Those who have God's grace to see further than the present will always have this kind of patience. You see, when we see, by God's grace, beyond the present moment, we see that if we are wronged, the Lord said in Hebrews 11 that the early believers took joyfully the spoiling of their goods because they saw that through losing here they gained Christ. Because Jesus lost everything, gave up everything, and was totally the worst mistreated person of all. And he gained through that. And we see Christ in me will be patient. But continuing, because I can't go so long in each one if we're going to go through all 15, Christ in me will be kind. The other side of patience is here. Taking any grief, giving anything helpful and useful, healing wounds. This is not just the, the not responding wrongly to someone's bad Activity, but this is responding rightly toward the one who has wronged us. That kindness characterizes our lives. Thirdly, Christ in me will be not jealous. This is the beginning of the listing of eight negative descriptions of love in action. It's what love is not doing. There will be seven positive actions, all told in the list, eight negative ones, that together give us a complete portrait of Christ. Christ's love is never envious. The root word here is to boil or seethe. The evil to be repented of is not the mere I want what you have, it's the malignant I don't want you to have what I can't have. This is that envy that says, I don't have what you have and I don't like that you have it and I don't even want you to have it. And it's, it's the opposite of what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to rejoice with those that rejoice. I mean, if someone gets promotion, rejoice. If someone gets a new house, rejoice. If someone, they're the ones that's going to have to pay for it. If someone gets a new car, rejoice. They're the ones going to be bothered when someone keys the door. You're not. Or when it gets hail damage or whatever happens, rejoice with them. This means we are not jealous. Christ in me, fourthly, will be not bragging. This whole idea of, of bragging, it's an interesting word. It's, it's the word for windbag. It's someone that's full of themselves, and every time you poke them, they just just comes out they just talk about themselves it's just you just poke them and they just start telling their story it's like the little dolls that you can buy at cracker barrel you just touch them and they just start talking you know and and that's how people are they are very bragging christ's love is not boastful christ did not verbalize himself when when he was poked he said i didn't come to do my own thing i came to do the will of what my father not my will but thine be done Christ in me will be not bragging. Fifthly, Christ in me will not be arrogant. Christ's love is never conceited. This is the attitude of pride. It's the idea I'm better. It's when one becomes inflated with their own importance. They, they, and I've told you this before. When you look at a picture, when someone says, hey, did you see this picture? Who do we look for? Ourself. If we're not there, we look for our grandchildren or someone, you know, our child or something. But we always, on a list of names, we look to see if our name's on there. The winners, you know, we, of course we should be on there, right? And that's this idea that Christ in me is not arrogant. We do not seek our own. Christ in me will not be acting unbecomingly. The word is rude. Christ's love is not rude. Love does not behave gracelessly. The Greek word for grace and charm are notably the same. In other words, I should be, if Christ is living out of me, winsome. Remember, even Jesus' enemies would come to him and listen to him, and they'd go back and report, we never heard a man speak like this. They were moved, even though they didn't like him and hated him. Christ in me will not be rude, not act unbecomingly. The seventh quality, Christ in me will not be seeking its own. Christ's love is not insistent on its own rights, but seeks Christ's attitude when he took upon himself the form of a servant. Jesus took upon himself the form of a slave. 
Now, in, in America, slavery is evil. In God's economy, we're to be slaves to one another and especially to God and to Christ. We know the concept. We just think it's terrible. But it's actually the currency of the kingdom that we are his subjects. And if we are God's slaves and he tells us to love everyone with this kind of love, we become willing to slave for others. And that's the wonder. Christ in me will not be provoked that's the eighth quality. Christ's love is never flying into a rage. This is a lack of becoming exasperated. It's interesting. Proverbs twenty five twenty eight says, He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that the walls are down. When we get exasperated, it breaks our walls down. When we fly into a rage and are angry, it, it lowers our defenses. In fact, in Ephesians 4, when it talks about giving place to the devil, it's right in context of a list that has to do with anger and wrath and evil speaking. And all of those things lower our spiritual defenses. Christ in me will not be provoked. There are only two kinds of people, those who think of their rights and those who think of others. Our mind sight is either selfish, we measure everything how it helps me, or selfless, how I can express Christ's love. To others. Number nine, Christ in me will not be taking into account wrongs suffered. Christ's love seeks to remember no evil. This is refusing to store up a memory of all the wrongs received. It's a liberating truth to grasp hold like an accountant of a clear ledger and say, Lord, I will not hold on to these. I will give them to you. And whatever ones need to be dealt with, you will deal with them. It's such a liberating thing. Chrysostom, the Byzantine preacher of Constantinople, said, Love is like a spark falling into the ocean is quenched. Love is the love of Christ so strong that all the hurts are like sparks that fall into the ocean and they're immediately quenched. And so that we cannot keep track of the wrongs against us. The scriptures tell us, as God does not hold our sin against us, we must not hold them against each other. Number 10, Christ in me will not rejoice in unrighteousness. Christ's love is taking no pleasure in evil reports. In fact, that's what the heathen are like. It says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 32, the heathen love to repeat the evil about others. We don't. The meaning of iniquity is unrighteousness. We don't rejoice in iniquity or unrighteousness. Unrighteousness talks about sin. Love never rejoices in someone else's sin. It's a grief to us. We don't say, oh, they finally got what they deserved, didn't they? It's so easy to do that. That is not what Christ does. He sorrows. Number 11, Christ in me positively will be rejoicing in the truth. And as Psalm 15 says, those who are godly speak the truth in their hearts. One cannot be righteous until he behaves himself according to God's truth. And so we rejoice in the truth and we behave that right. If you believe right, you behave right. Number 12, Christ in me will bear all things. Literally, this word means to cover on all sides, to cover in silence. The word stegai, it's very interesting. It means to cover in silence. And, and bearing all things... Uh, means it's not talking about enduring a trial. It's talking about covering the ugliness of someone else's life. Love out of respect and honest concern for the real value of another person will do everything it can to cover up the sin of that person. In fact, the word used here is very pictural. It, it speaks of a watertight vessel that, that never leaks in. And, and it pictures something that's held in that, that, that even knowing something ugly about someone else, love resists letting that leak out. It's such a beautiful picture. It's used of a roof which does not leak. It's used of troops defending a fortress. It's used of ice bearing weight and not giving away. It's standing up bravely to not give in to the way of our world that when we're harmed, out gushes the venom of hurting someone else. Thirteenth, Christ in me will be believing all things. His grace enables us to not be suspicious of others, but trust in God's plan. This action of love makes me completely trust in God and believing the best about others. Love sees weakness, but throws a mantle of silence over it, bearing all things, and then believes the best. You see how these actions are interrelated. If we are going to make a mistake about someone's character, we should err on the side of love. Make a mistake in trusting or believing them too much. 
The Corinthians were evidently believing the worst. They suspect and assumed everyone was wrong. They were suing and doing all kinds of stuff. They had a predisposition that others were evil. And so they were cynical and suspicious. Once you start hating someone, you will try and find their faults. On the contrary, once you start loving someone, you start covering their faults. Remember it says love covers a multitude of sin, 1 Peter 4. Last two, Christ in me will be hoping all things. Even amid repeated disappointments, there is a constant assurance God has a future and is working all things for his own glory. Love refuses to take failure as final. Think about that. Jesus wouldn't accept failure from Peter. Paul wouldn't accept failure from the Corinthians. Many a grace-energized loving wife has held on to a struggling and falling husband. Many a grace-energized loving parent has held on to a wayward child. And many a loving friend has held on to a fallen brother by just holding on to this spirit-prompted hope, not accepting failure as final. Hope does not persuade itself that the thief is honest, but holds tight knowing that that thief was made for honesty, for purity, and for glorifying God, and holding on to that hope that God will change them and not giving up on them. Finally, Christ in me will be enduring all things. This Greek term translated endureth in the King James is a military term. It has to do with being positioned in the middle of a violent battle. The emphasis is not on handing little minor annoyances. It refers to a love that stands wounded and bleeding against incredible opposition and still loves. When love is resisted, this this endurance clicks in and doesn't give up. Love never fails. Love never dies. Love doesn't end. Love cannot be conquered. This is the love that took Jesus to Calvary. As it says in 1 John 3.16, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How sound and healthy is your love this morning? Let's bow and pray. Father in heaven, I pray that 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, will become the way we check our health. Because you've said, by this we'll all know that we're your children by the love of the healthy, sound, complete, non-defective, functioning, action, love. And I pray that this brief survey would, would stir up in our hearts our need to put on love, to live in love, to love one another as you love us, and to let your love, Romans 5 tells us, to be shed abroad in our hearts by your Spirit who lives within. May the river of love flow out of our lives and may we be positively like Christ and also negatively like you were not and may your love increasingly characterize our lives may we be reminded that it is you who live within us alone that can make us this way it's not any goodness we have it's your righteousness and your grace that we need to love this way. May we have soundness of love for the glory of God.